Good morning and welcome to the 30th episode of the Clements Bookworm. I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clements Library. Please note that today's session is being recorded and we will send an email out later this afternoon with a copy of the recording and any resources mentioned in today's broadcast. We um, have been using Zoom a lot and I know many of you have as well, but I just wanna give you a couple of tips in case you're joining the Clements Library for the first time. We encourage you to chime in in the chat uh, please select all panelists and attendees so that we can participate as a community. However, you'll notice that the conversation goes by very quickly. So use the Q&A section to ask questions. You can also see other participants' questions there and upvote them, give them a little thumbs up if it's a question you also have. And if we type in any answers, they can be posted right there with the question or if you have comments or additional parts to that question, go ahead and type them in as well. Side-by-side -side mode allows you to see both the slides and the speaker. I can only control so much of what you see, so please play around with it. You can move the separator to change the relative size of each. Uh, you can view speaker mode or gallery view. Uh, so change those things around so that you get the best experience possible. We do have the live machine captioning turned on as part of our DE&I, our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiative at the Clements Library. You can toggle that on or off, and you can also change the size and some other settings. So please um, adjust that as you need as well. This program is brought to you by the William L. Clements Library on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. All right, we're going to close that opening poll. So if you have a chance to click very quickly, please do. I will end the polling and share the results. So one of the topics we'll discuss today is the use of medicalized language. And uh, we asked you to consider how frequently you describe something as crazy. And as you see from the poll, many of us do use that term um, either sometimes or often. So we, we will talk a little bit more about that and sort of the his, history of those kinds of terminologies. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Jane Ptolemy, my colleague, who will be leading the discussion with Sarah Swedberg. Uh, Jane is the Assistant Curator of Manuscripts at the Clements Library and received her BA from Albion College in 2006 with a major in history and a concentration in ethnic studies. In 2013, she graduated from Yale University with a dual PhD in history and African American studies. Jane, thank you so much for leading today's discussion. Glad to, and I'm doubly glad to because I have such fond memories of Sarah's visit with us as a Peckham Fellow in 2019. So it's always a delight to see the fruits of your labor and to be in conversation with you about how the project has evolved and in our time together. Great, so thank you. <laughs> welcome and thank you for being with us. Um, so to help people just have a sense of where we are, I just want to introduce Sarah quickly. So Dr. Swedberg is a professor of history at Colorado Mesa University, where she has taught since 1999. Her interests vary, as can be evidenced by her wonderful blog posts, which can be found at Nursing Clio, where she's a regular writer. But most of her scholarly attention has focused on the period of the American Revolution and the early re Republic. Liberty and Insanity in the Age of the American Revolution, published in 2020, is her first book. 2020 was kind of a big year for you because you were also received the 2020 Distinguished Faculty Award, so congratulations on both fronts. 
Thank you. We're going to just to, to kick off the conversation, I was hoping that you could just kind of give us a brief synopsis of the book. So if anybody hasn't had the chance to read it yet, they can get a sense of what your main arguments are. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> it's always hard to summarize. And, and in many ways, I think I'm still getting to an understanding of what I wrote. Um, <laughs> but I, I started out by looking at, I started out actually in 2011. Um, when I was a fellow at a National Endowment for the Humanities fellow. We were housed at the Library Company of Philadelphia and the seminar that we were involved in was called The Problem of Governance in the Early Republic. I went into the seminar not really knowing what I wanted to do, but I started to read medical texts. And what I found was the so-called mad doctors from the time really argued that liberty caused insanity. And so I started with the premise that if that's true, then how do you create a good government? If a good government therefore creates insanity. And I started to examine the ways that people worried about their governments as they created them and governments on all level from people who were imprisoned during the siege of Boston to colonial governments, to state governments, to the national government that was created out of the American Revolution. But then I also started to look at people using the words insane, lunatic, madman, madwoman, crazy to describe their political opponents and really examined the, the ways that people use that as a way to divide us versus them to other people, usually on a political scale. It ended up being very much a political history, which surprised me. I never thought of myself as being a political historian. I always thought of myself as a, a social historian and a historian of, of gender. Uh, but I ended, ended up writing a book that is largely about politics and both those concerns about madness in the politicians or other political actors, but also the ways that political parties and other things were formed in part through this language of madness. Great, thank you. Um, you know, I think uh, as someone who struggles reading political histories, I, I could feel like your interest in social history and these different lenses really coming to play and making this a, a very readable political history for me because you bring all these different kind of analyses and focus onto, onto the political story that really brought it alive to me in a different way. So I first just thank you for, for doing that and letting me see that this period in a new way. Um, could you maybe talk through just a little bit what kind of sources kind of shaped your thinking about this? Because I think that kind of sometimes help us circle around some of these things and kind of illustrate them for us. Yeah, absolutely. So I started reading in Dr. Benjamin Rush's library housed at the Library Company of Philadelphia, which is where the seminar was. I um, read his, his lectures because he was very interested in all sorts of illness, including mental illness. He was an early proponent of the Pennsylvania Hospital. He was an early proponent for better treatment of people with mental illness, um, although he didn't necessarily always follow his own protocols. And then from there, I started reading outward in his library. And luckily for me, because as someone who lives in a place that's hard to get in and out of, a lot of these materials are digitized. But I started to read the other medical texts from the time period, um, like Dr. Johann Spurzheim, was, who was a German doctor living in London. Um, and again, was, I mentioned this earlier, but here is one of the people who argued that liberty caused insanity. I love this passage from his text. He's writing about England and talking about how all the freedom in England caused insanity. And I love that little asterisk that says, these truths are applicable to the United States. Um, this is the, the first one of his books that I read. And I read this edition, which is the first American edition, which has an appendix by an American doctor. He says, no, 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 he's wrong. It's not the, the English who are most likely to go insane. We are the freest people in mm -hmm. the United States. So we are most likely to go insane. And so I really started with these medical texts, but then moved on to really just globally look for 
references to madness or insanity or the other words that were being used for that. Um, my, my method was, was perhaps mad in and of itself. I just ended up asking for everything mm -hmm. <laughs> within a time period and then going through boxes of archival material, um, but also looking at pamphlets and um, speeches and all of these other things that might have references to the political world and madness. That sounds hard, like, you know, trying to cast that wide net. That sounds like a real challenge. Did it was that like just really time consuming? Was there any other challenges like using that type of approach posed for you? Um, I, I think for me, it is my biggest challenge is that I am so easily distracted that I, I just I love actually sitting there and looking for this language. It's the challenge for me is when to stop and start trying to put words on the page because I could have probably spent the rest of my life digging through materials and finding these references because once you start looking for them, they're everywhere. When mm -hmm. I started this project, I really worried that maybe I was making this up, uh, maybe I was stretching too far, but then you start looking and what you find is these references are everywhere and they're mm -hmm. everywhere in part because of that 18th century idea of the body politic. The people that I study believed that the body politic, so society and government, worked the same way as the physical body did. That just like the physical body could get cancer or become mad, get a fever, that the body politic could exhibit those same diseases as well. And oftentimes the cure that was argued for in the body politic was exactly like the cure argued for in the body. So bleeding or um, <laughs> rational conversation, which was one of the things that the medical doctors started to argue was good for people who were insane. Sometimes restraint was argued for both people who were mentally ill, but also for the body politic. And so it really is everywhere. Um, I very much enjoyed looking for that everywhere. And I think really the, the biggest challenge was then pivoting to getting that on a page in the way that it made sense. Yeah. You know, I think it's a testament to kind of expansive thinking that if you acknowledge that medical history informs political history, then you start to see those uh, connections in a really interesting way. And I had never, before this, I had never thought about like the body politic as a body. So that was a really powerful way to like bring this kind of the thinking of the time to bear on, on that moment, which I thought was really um, useful for me to kind of like, oh, okay, I see that. Um, but thinking about distractions, uh, what kind of sources or distractions did you find at the Clements as you were going through that process? Yeah, so I, I came into the Clements as the Peckham Fellow really focused on specifically on the war years. I had written the later chapters, but I haven't hadn't written the chapter about the war itself yet. So I, I came in really looking at the years from 1775 till about 17 probably 1780 or so, but I found so many good sources there. Thank you, thank you all to the Clements Library. It was a really wonderful experience and I can't wait to be back someday. Um, but one of the, the things that I found there and one of the real richness of your sources is that you have not just the, the writings from people in North America, but also from other parts of Europe. So one of the first ones that I found was from George Cressner, who is in England, and he is writing to his friend William Knox. And he is writing about, this is 1775, so about the Massachusetts Growing Rebellion. And I love this section in this letter, and it really helped me form the chapters that I wrote specifically about the American Revolution because he wrote, I look on the Bostonians as men in a high fever, bleeding will bring them to their senses. 
So here you have that medical metaphor and he meant bleeding very literally. He was saying that he thought that military action would be the only thing that would restore the Bostonians to their rational mind. That you had to send forces to wound and kill the Bostonians to bring them back to health in his mind. Mm. Um, it, it, it's one of the really powerful things that I started to see in all sorts of correspondence is for people who were really made nervous by what was going on in the North American colonies, the ways that they saw that as a mental illness. Um, mm. So fever, right? So the humoral theory that everything is out of whack, uh, but one of the cures for that is bleeding. But my favorite find, thanks to Cheney, was the Strachey papers. Um, Henry Strachey was uh, another person who lived in England, but had land in North America. He gets caught up in the American Revolution. He becomes secretary to Lord Howe. He is in North America and a, an observer of firsthand a lot of what's going on in the colonies. He, or now by the time he's writing this, the United States, because they have declared independence. He writes these really wonderful letters back to his wife about what he's observing. And in two occasions, about two weeks apart, he writes that he believes, and, and part of it's here. So um, prosperity has made them mad. I shall hereafter think it possible that a frenzy may seize a whole nation as well as an individual. And about two weeks later, he writes almost the exact same thing to her as well. So that, again, the body politic, a whole nation, and it's interesting that he's calling them a nation because he's still at this point convinced that they will not become a nation, but that a nation can go mad. So interesting. And that he's writing this to his wife too. You know, you you do kind of bring in women into this conversation too. That it's not just you know, the elite men or doctors who are doing this type of language. That like women are part of that conversation and, and that kind of language as well. So that I appreciated those moments where you kind of show the the breadth of that conversation. That this wasn't just you know one type of person thinking this way. That it really was really widespread. Yeah, you know, I think. Um, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, please, please. If you have any thoughts on that, that'd be great. No, I was just I I I, I tried really hard, and I, and I think I I could have done even a better job of bringing in some of the voices that are normally left out. Mm. Um, at, with a political history, it was harder than I wanted it to be. Mm. But I also I'm always really aware of those silences and those voices and just all of the, the good work that people have done to really look at the silences in the archives as well as the silences in what we write. Mm -hmm. um, I know my, my, uh, one of my peer reviewers really pushed me to make this a better manuscript. And so I hope I responded to some of her comments on those lines in a way that, that made it a better book. Well, as a reader, I will say it felt very successful in terms of opening my eye up because I do feel like I was, as I was reading, I, I felt myself come to this presumption that like, these are all men talking. And then you put that moment. I was like, oh, check yourself. Like, no, this is like <laughs> women are part of this. And like, you know, even as someone who's very invested in women and gender studies, I found myself thinking of like medicine as a men's a male field and like so I appreciated the work that your book was doing to be like to push you to think bigger and to think more inclusively in terms of who is actually engaging in this so it, it worked on me so I'm sure it, it'll work more broadly too so I, I appreciated that work that you did um you know one of the other powerful things that I found reading this book is that you like really effectively highlighted the tensions and contradictions that are present in this moment, this revolutionary moment where Americans are pushing so stridently for liberty, 
but while they're doing so, they're also kind of pointedly denying it to others who oppose them. So whether that be loyalists or pacifists or merchants, you know, that even as they're espousing this rhetoric of liberty, that if someone contradicts their vision of what liberty should be, that they don't necessarily feel all that bad about denying them their liberties. And that either side was really leveraging this language of madness to discredit their opponents and kind of rationalize even the most irrational and unrestrained behavior on their own parts. Could you kind of talk us through a little bit like that disconnect and what you think that does for really like how we understand the revolutionary moment? Yeah, um, I, I think all of this complicated the American Revolution for me even, and I've been studying this since I was an undergraduate. Um, but thinking about, first I, I became really uncomfortable with the use of extra legal violence. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways that they use this language of, of madness was to create distance between those who are on our side and those who are on the other side, but sometimes without any clear evidence. We think that this person is an enemy to our cause. And it's really problematic in 1775 before the Declaration of Independence when Congress really is not a legal body yet. Um, but to say this person who I believe I'm going to name a loyalist or name unpatriotic, I am going to seize that person, strip their body pour hot tar over them, roll them in threat feathers and put them in a cart or on a horse to display that body because we're rational and they're not rational in their response. So everything from that small scale mob action and when we, we did our book rehearsal, I, one of the things that really I, I talked about this, I was made even more comfortable because I was writing this mostly between the years of 2016 to 2020. Um, and in my community, which is um, its own special place, <laughs> uh, but there's, there's a really strong white supremacist presence here who are very visibly armed because we have open carry. And so for instance, when my friends went to testify at city council about the racism that they faced in this community, they literally had to walk through a mob of very heavily armed people who considered them irrational, who publicly denounced the fact that their experiences were real experiences. And so I think that also played very much into me thinking about these mob behaviors and even things that I had celebrated in the past is, is some of the more violent Stamp Act protests, for instance, I became really uncomfortable with them. So that's that's one example of many examples. And then a kind of a bigger example, and a lot of people, a lot of scholars of loyalists have already written about this. But the Quakers, who were not really loyalists, right? A lot of the people that were called loyalists weren't really loyalists. They were pacifists or they wanted to be left alone or something else was going on. But as pacifists, they refused to support the war effort. And because of that, Congress decided without evidence that they were guilty and exiled a number of Philadelphia male Quakers to Virginia. One of the, the men died in Virginia. Um, eventually they were allowed back home in part because the Quakers themselves being their wonderful Quaker selves just kept saying, you know, you all are being really hypocritical that you are denying us the writ of habeas corpus, you are denying us our rights, you would say that you're liberty men, but what you're doing is worse than what Britain ever did to the colonies. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting kind of using this revolutionary moment to really kind of take a step back and think through like when you are driven by the power of your convictions and when those, that conviction is then coupled with this kind of linguistic intellectual milieu where you can say, well, you just, you're just crazy. So I don't have to apply the same principles to you because you are, you know, you're not operating in the same sphere as me, that it does make it such that the, the divide is so big that you can behave against them 
in such a kind of um, sometimes really ugly way, you know, and I agree that when I was reading that book, I was like, uh-huh, like, okay, like, I think reading it in our political environment, reading your book in, in our current kind of tumultuous moment, I was like, really relating to that. I'm like, I see that, you know, like that same type of us versus them, you don't know what you're talking about, you know, like, you, this kind of really strong divide that uh, separates us. Um, like, I, I could see that kind of mapped onto that same conversation. I just want to kind of open up a little bit more space to like ask you whether kind of as you're researching and writing this book, like, has it shaped how you see kind of the political divides and tumult in our own moment? And, and like, do you see those same kinds of um, same kinds of language or thought processes playing out? And how does that make you kind of respond to it? Yeah, it, it absolutely does. And particularly in one of my later chapters where, where I'm writing about, when I wrote about the American response to the French Revolution, that 1790s, um, it's crazy <laughs> to use that language, right? Um, that writing that chapter in the midst of our current tumult both troubled me on a lot of levels, but it also strangely comforted me mm -hmm. to understand that this, the, these divides have existed from the very beginning and that they are put into our government structures, I think in ways that unless we change our government structures will always be with us. Mm -hmm that more or less we have survived through those with some big exceptions like the American Civil War, but that name calling the charges of fake news, right? The, the really bitter enmity against your political rivals. That is something that we have always had. And my students know this. So hello students, if you're, you're on here, I know some of you are. My students know that because I often wave my arms around madly and say there was never an original intent, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Or, or um, tell them that very clearly that those calls for a return to civility, those are from people who don't know our history because there was never civility in government. And in mm -hmm. fact, oftentimes there was violent response to political enemies to the point of caning people on right. Congress floor and things like that. It's one of the things I love most about the humanities is that it like reading and, and thinking and exploring these moments in the past gives you this entry to then really just sit back and think about your own moment and your own complicity and your own power to make change and see your moment and like do something about it. So I appreciated reading your book and what that, that did for me to really like, oh, I understand a little bit better now. So um, thank you for that. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that a project like yours kind of requires a, a real sense of sensitivity because you do explore kind of medical and personal accounts of people's like actual lived experience with mental health challenges, which I think was really important to do in a book like this to say it's not just language, it's actual life. You know, and I was especially touched with how you handled the cases of Sarah Henry, you know, wife of give me liberty or give me death, Patrick Henry and Pamela Sedgwick, who was wife to a congressman. And both of these women are kind of suffering from mental illness as their husbands themselves are away laboring over questions of liberty and political madness while they're separated from like the actual like mental illness struggles happening back at home. And so it really was making me really think through kind of does the political co-option of the language around insanity and madness and instability and fervor, does that analogy kind of do a disservice to the actual people who then are kind of struggling with these issues in their personal lives when on this big kind of like meta level people are flinging these terms around and kind of desensitizing people to it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I wish, I wish there were more materials out there about Sarah Henry because um, it is such an interesting story, but mm -hmm. I think the family erased what records were there. 
because she was suffering from some form of mental illness and her family in the end put her in a basement that was allegedly sunny, according to family records. Uh, I, I, I spent a lot of time also thinking about the use of imagination in writing mm -hmm. history. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time really thinking about trying to imagine these scenarios and wondering, is it right? Is a basement really sunny? Um, mm -hmm. What does that look like? Is it damp? Is it dark? Is it smelly? Um, and of course, I can't know, but I can think a lot about that. So she is put confined in their home in the basement. Patrick Henry decides that his job as a spokesperson for liberty is really the most important thing, more so than taking care of his wife. And so he is out trying to get people up for the cause of opposing Britain. Um, she eventually dies probably by suicide, it's mm -hmm. unclear. Uh, she is taken care of by one of her daughters and her son-in-law, and of course the enslaved people who live in the house who get mm -hmm. no mention in the, the family histories of this. Um, but I, I really thought about that because she dies shortly before Patrick Henry gives his most famous speech where allegedly he said, give me liberty or give me death. And I, I just, I found myself wondering, is he thinking about his now deceased wife whom he had confined in a basement room? She didn't really have that choice. Well, I guess maybe she did if she died by suicide, maybe she chose death because she couldn't have liberty. Um, mm -hmm. And I can't know, but I think those questions are really important. And the same later for Pamela Sedgwick, who's writing to her husband in Congress, please come home, please come home. I, I really, I, I've lost my senses, please come home. And he says, no, my job here is more important. Um, and it, it really, really, really bothered me in, in all of those cases and in the other cases that I detail. So the, the first chapter, I really look at the questions of confinement for insanity in an age of liberty, because the people who are confined, those who can, are often writing about how this is just like other forms of being denied liberty because they claim they are sane and that this liberty has been taken away from them by doctors or others. Um, and it raises those big questions, not just about their personal lives, but about the body politic and about the powers under which they live. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really powerful how you combine these things into this much bigger kind of historical picture that is operating on all of these different levels from the personal to the national and that you have to kind of see them comprehensively to really get a sense of, of really what's going on and how people are not just saying these things, but like integrating them into their daily lives and the disconnects that happen um, and always have happened. Um, kind of along that vein, could you maybe talk through a little bit of um, kind of change over time or cross place, you know, that you, you write kind of a really expansive story where you're talking about the South and the North, you're talking about Britain and France. Um, and it's really compelling, but like the question that it raises for me is like, so is it the same everywhere or what kind of distinctions take place? And can you kind of talk us through some of those questions? Yeah, and um, it, it's a really good question. And I'm not sure I have a really good answer for it. It's probably something that I should have thought about more. I was very aware um, when writing it, the, the previous work that I've done, which is mostly unpublished, mostly focused on New England. And so if I'm telling a national story in this time period, I was really aware that I needed to not just talk about New England, but I needed mm -hmm. to talk about other places as well. That was made easier by the fact that I was in the seminar in Philadelphia. So that started to bring in some of that. Um, and the Clements was so good at, at giving me access to sources that were in other regions as well, because a lot of the archival work that I'd done was in Middle Atlantic or New England states. Um, but really thinking about 
Right, and this goes to all of the, the more recent work about vast early America, um, to the, the thoughts that when we write about nation, we're not just writing about the nation because it's so connected to the rest of the world. And so thinking about those connections, particularly in the colonial period, obviously to Great Britain, that the questions that the colonists are raising are the same questions or similar questions to the ones that people in England are raising. Um, the fact that the United, what becomes the United States, so North America colonies and then the United States is not this island in the middle of nowhere, but is connected to England and France um, in all sorts of ways through trade, certainly through politics, through negotiations, through all of these other things. And so I really tried to bring more stories from other regions in just to, to kind of balance my own previous real Northeastern bias and to really think about those connections. And so in some ways, things that seemed dissimilar ended up in the same chapter in mm -hmm. ways that I think show connection. So one of my early chapters, I think is chapter two. I look at um, the end of the, the Seven Years' War, the Paxton Volunteers' violence against the Conestoga Indians, which many people deemed insane, but they claimed was a rational response to their having liberty taken away. The regulation in North Carolina, also backcountry settlers, um, but aimed well, also aimed at their colonial government. Um, and then the larger Stamp Act and other protests. And I, I really saw them not as different. And, and part of this also is for any of us who mostly teach. I mean, I teach at some place with a 4-4 load and I think others who teach similarly. The way we teach things really um, shapes the way that we we think about things until we start writing about them. And, and so these things that I had taught about as very different really seem very similar. If you look at it through the lens of mental illness or, or that language that's being used, because in each case, people are, are either condemning extra legal violence or are using extra legal violence and justifying it through that use of rationality or madness. Yeah. Now you you thank you thank your students in your acknowledgments, which I really love. Um, <laughs> could you talk a little bit more about um, how you might include any of your sources or arguments in your teaching, or what you might, if there if there are teachers on this call, what you might kind of propose that they do as well, or use some of this stuff in their own teaching to complicate this for their students? Yeah, and I think I, I think again for any of us who teach places with heavy teaching loads, um, one of the ways that we can think through our own research ideas, it has to come in the classroom because we just don't have time to do it outside of the classroom. And so I, I tried out a lot of these ideas in my various classes. When I taught the early American Republic last time, I brought in some of the sources that I had found um, in my earlier research at that time that must have been it must have been right after I came back from my, my sabbatical, my year sabbatical in 2018 and 2019. Um, so I, I bring in sources, particularly for the upper division history majors to grapple with um, and ask them to think through some of the same things that I'm thinking through. And it, mm -hmm. it really is, it's amazing because sometimes places where I have a block, maybe just because I've been thinking about it too much they're able to offer interpretations, which really, really help me in my thinking. Um, it's also just very much changed the way that even in the US history surveys that I teach, that I they teach about the revolutionary era, um, trying to complicate it more. It's, it's harder to do in those, those freshman level classes, but I still try to do it uh, to talk about the various responses and to bring some of those stories in. Um, so I don't think I, I necessarily, I, I don't think I ever get it 100% right. And so I don't have advice for other people uh, because it's always trial and error. Um, but I think particularly we, we just have, our history majors are just really, really wonderful. And they 
are very willing, even if they come in with the standard social memory of the American Revolution stories that they've heard all their lives, most of them are willing to at least loosen the hold of that social memory a little bit and engage with new questions. And so I say, hey, everyone, what happens if we, we look at this question or what happens if we try to center black voices instead of white voices or female voices instead of male voices? Um, and almost 100% of the time, they're willing to do that. Sometimes they're just like right now, everyone's too tired to do anything. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I appreciate you acknowledging like there are limits to what we can do. There are only so many hours in a day and it's the same with a book. You can't do everything in the space of a couple hundred pages and you have to get the thing written and published. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little space. Like, is there anything, any sources or stories that were left out of the book out of, for whatever reason um, that you just kind of itching to talk about? Yeah, so I in, initially thought when I wrote the book proposal, I thought I would be taking it into a later time period, not super late, but I thought I'd be going up maybe to the War of 1812, mostly because some of the early research I'd done on the project focused on the turn of the century, so 1800, 1801, because of the election of Jefferson and all of the political madness, very literally, around that moment. I put a little bit of that into the last chapter, the epilogue, um, but I, I was a little sad that I had to leave that later, that later piece out to the extent that I covered other things, particularly because so many of Jefferson's political opponents saw him as embodying the madness of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that because it ended up being a political history, and although I was able to bring some personal stories in, I didn't do that to the extent that I initially thought I would. And so I, I think as I move forward, I want to come back to an abandoned project about the lived experience of depression of spirits, as I called it. Uh, I had written some on this before and had worked some on this before and then started working on this new project. And, and so all of that stuff is still in my, my various files if I can find it. <laughs> and, um, but come back to people like Pamela Sedgwick who was very clearly suffering while her husband is away with children. And sometimes she's just so joyful about being a mother and, and other times she's just really, really in a bad place. Um, to come back to people like Deborah Norris Logan, who shows up in some parts writing about the political sphere, but she was the, the wife of a medical doctor. She experienced depression of spirits herself, but she also commented on some of the patients that her husband treated as well. Um, and so I, I think some of those personal stories are really important to be told. Some of them have been told to a certain extent. There certainly is some really good research out there, but I, I really feel tugged towards the social history and the gender history, um, I think in part because I wrote such a political history. Well, count me in. I wanna read that. I wanna read that and I hope you come to the library to do your research on it so we can be a part of that journey with you and think through those things and talk with you over tea time again about <laughs> these things. Um, I want to make sure we have time for a Q&A because this is such a dynamic topic and so compelling. Um, but thank you, Sarah, for talking with me and thinking these things through and for sharing your work. We're really excited for this book and what comes next. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, we're going to have a, a continue the lively discussion with the Q&A. Uh, everybody, please put your questions into the Q&A section. I am just going to do a couple of housekeeping announcements and then we'll get to those questions. So we invite you to con continue thinking about some of the stories um, around the American Revolution during our next uh, lecture. So this is not a bookworm. So we encourage you to register for this. Um, 
on April 22nd at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we will uh, welcome Serena Zabin to discuss her book, The Boston Massacre, A Family History. Her book reflects on the personal and political conflicts that erupted in the Boston Massacre, emphasizing the stories of the many regimental wives and children who accompanied the troops sent to Boston in 1768 and who became neighbors to the colonists in Boston. When soldiers shot unarmed citizens in the street, it was these intensely human and now broken bonds that fueled the American Revolution. So please register to join us for that. In addition, our next bookworm, we're starting here in Michigan to think about going up north and uh, visiting various places in the Great Lakes region. So we have invited Art Cohn and Stacy Daniels to share stories of maritime heritage in the Great Lakes region. As someone who's already registered for the bookworm, you will receive a reminder for each of the um, episodes after this one. You can watch it live or you will also receive the um, follow-up email with a link to the recording. And in fact, later today, you'll receive a link to the recording and any resources that were mentioned today. We really appreciate everyone's participation in this bookworm series. If you'd like to sponsor a future episode, you can contact me or Ann Bennington Helper. And as always, your gifts are important to help make the Clements resources available for the study of exploration and history. Okay, thank you. We are ready to do some questions. I see that, um, let's see, our first one that we'll talk about is Whitney is asking, did any of the early people of the Republic written about um, the madness of the slave revolts and the enslaved people rising up in madness for liberty? And so she's thinking about uh, the 1791 Haiti um, riot and uh, et cetera, et cetera, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I do write a little bit about Haiti. I, I, my book ends before the, the most, most of that tumult happens, but I do write a little bit about that in the book. Um, so the, the medical doctors actually, they wrote, if liberty causes insanity, then slaves are incapable of being insane. Um, but of course, that's given lie over and over and over again in the fact that at the same time, they believe that enslaved people, the medical doctors say enslaved people can't go insane. There are enslaved people being placed in hospitals or um, later institutions or being confined. Um, it, and uh, there's a lot, of, I have a lot of questions and not always a lot of answers. One of the stories I wrote about very early on is in Philadelphia, a woman has her enslaved worker, Adam, put into the Pennsylvania hospital for being insane, but then she checks him out. And so I think, was he really mentally ill or was he being um, intractable in the ways that slave owners often thought that the people they owned were being intractable. Um, did she put him in there for punishment? And I, I don't know, I, there's not enough information, but the fact that she checked him out instead of waiting for a cure um, makes me really, really suspicious, right? That she decided that, and, and I don't know, maybe she was having a ball or maybe something else was happening. And again, I don't know, but just thinking about all the possibilities there. Of course, later in the 19th century, a Southern doctor wrote that slaves running away was a form of madness instead of seeing it as a rational response to a very inhumane system. He said that he called it drapetomania, that this was, this was an irrational response to slavery. And so that comes in there as well. Um, certainly, particularly in Philadelphia, uh, as many of the, the people are leaving, being forced out of Haiti, um, many of the white 
Turks are being forced out of Haiti during the, the early stages of what becomes that revolution, uh, there is also a lot of fear both about the effect of the disorder in Saint-Domingue um, on the early United States, but also certainly fear about their own um, their own enslaved populations and the possibility of revolt. So there's a lot of tension, a lot of fear there. Um, there is also a lot of use of, you know, people who are claiming liberty while enslaving others. Of course, people then pointed out the difficulty. Um, but I, I think I just need to mention this one story that it's just really disturbing to me is the North Carolina regulators using the decayed body of an executed enslaved person as part of their protest in the North Carolina regulation. They took the body of this deceased person and put it at the judge's bar in the courthouse as part of their, as part of their protest. And that use of that denial of bodily autonomy, both in life and death, while they're claiming their own autonomy is really, really problematic. So I hope I answered the question. I, I think I went off on tangents. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's fun to see the questions today because I think I think actually going off on tangents, you know, you you really inspired people to think about times where they have seen this language and and to think about it. So, so some of these questions sort of go outside of that Revolutionary War era, um, because I know that, you know, we have questions about, um, you know, Tom is asking about uh, the cultural differences and perceptions between North and South. Have those been described as insanity or madness? Um, so I don't know if you have any comments about that. Yeah, and I, 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 I don't know enough about the, particularly the American Civil War, although I've taught it, but never, I, I just don't know it as thoroughly. But certainly um, it's language that is used all the time in our present political life. Uh, my congressional representative um, on her website calls her opponents leftist lunatics. Um, and so very much using that language to divide and to create a particular kind of political culture, I think. Um, and I, I'm sure, you know, I, I, I see it. I see the medicalized language all the time now that I've started looking at it in our present world where people talk about, there was one and I wrote about it in Nursing Clio and I can't remember who it is now, but um, it must have been a year ago, January, when I was visiting my mom um, and she always had CNN on really loud. <laughs> um, but uh, a congressional representative was talking about military action as in the same kind of medical metaphor. Well, sometimes we need bleeding. Um, so you can go in and look me up on Nursing Clio because I wrote about it there because it was so striking. I was in the later stages of finishing up my manuscript and to hear that on the, the television just made me run to my computer and start typing madly because I think there's still so many connections and I'm sure we see it in every conflict that we see, whether it's political or military. Mm -hmm. Well, and even some of the social social contexts too, because I know Tom was also commenting on, on the anti-vaxxer movement and how um, you know the, the language has has gone back and forth um, there. As and well. I just realized I misspelled my own name. <laughs> Sorry, family. <laughs> I left out a D. <laughs> um, so Tom is asking, if not a threat to others and in the absences of mental institutions, did communities tolerate and support insane individuals at some level? Um, yeah, um, so there's, there's a lot of different answers to that. Of course, it's both yes and no, because oftentimes people with mental illness are treated really badly by the people around them um, out of fear, out of all sorts of different reasons. 
the medical doctors in the 18th century really more and more worked towards a very humane treatment of the mentally ill. They didn't always practice what they preached, but we're moving more towards the idea of moral treatment. So instead of chaining people up, giving them good diet, exercise, rational conversation, fresh air as a way to help cure them. Um, very famously, uh, Dr. Pinnell went into the, the most famous of the mad hospitals in Paris. My French pronunciation is terrible. L'Hôpital Bicetre. Um, and unchained some of the people who are considered most dangerous and claim to have cured them. Um, there is a lot of, and it's a little bit later, it's more early 19th century, but there's a lot of children's literature about being kind to people who are mentally ill. Um, there is also the very much the understanding, and this comes out of the, the medical text as well, that it is very ordinary things that can make us lose our minds, and it can be us tomorrow. A lot of people are saying it's these people today, but it could be us tomorrow, and in some cases it was. Um, and so that trying to extend kindness because you never know what's around the corner these people aren't necessarily all that different from you. They've suffered a loss. Something else has happened that has temporarily, hopefully, taken them away from their senses. Uh, so there's a, there's a big push for kindness. There is also the very human response of unkindness. And so you, you see the mistreatment as well. Um, I think one of the, the examples, of course, that many people who study the American Revolution are familiar with is James Otis, Otis Jr., who had some form of mental illness, um, but also kept being elected to office. And so uh, one of the things I argue in the, the place where I write about him is perhaps because his mental illness kind of took away some of the politeness that people had otherwise, he was able to speak out for people in ways that they weren't able to speak out for themselves. And again, I don't know for sure, it's a, it's a proposition rather than a really strong conclusion. So there is a question about James Otis Jr. and wondering how his um, political allies were dealing with his insanity. Yeah. Um, they, <laughs> he made them nervous. He made them so nervous, uh, but they also, he was the person who articulated their vision better than most others did. And so they also embraced him. His political enemies, of course, used, tried to use his insanity against him. So people, of course, like Thomas Hutchinson, um, there is an interesting conversation that John Adams recorded in his diary. And now I can't remember who the conversation was with, um, but John Adams, who I don't think really liked James Otis on a really deep level, but admired him and admired what he had done for the cause, really steps up and defends him. And then later in his life defends him again. So I think even the people who were on the same political side, but for whom he was, made them a little bit uneasy they also saw that he was working towards the end that they all wanted. And so I think they did not distance themselves from him. And in fact, he kept being put into positions of power when he was, when he was in his right mind. He was sometimes confined and sometimes not able to do that work. Thank you. Um, Beth is wondering if you have any tips for someone who is looking to dive into their own research on the history of mental illness and confinement. Yeah, um, so absolutely. The, almost all of the medical texts are digitized. So either through Hathi Trust or even in, in the, the Google books, you can find most of them. I think that's probably the best place to start. Um, and then really the the other things are everywhere. Um, 
as far as references to mental illness or mental health. There's also, of course, a lot of work been done on the later period, early 19th century with the rise of the asylum. A lot of the books on the rise of the asylum are really a good, place, a good starting place as well. Thank you. So um, I'm not surprised somebody is wondering if you have any comments on General Mad Anthony Wayne. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> that is not a story that ended up in, in my, my book. So I'll, I'll leave that for somebody else. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, okay. So let's see. Um, so, Jim Davis is, is wondering, um, I guess I'll just read it. If I understand your thoughts, you think that liberty produces insanity and in significant ways creates causes and institutions associated with insanity. Is it possible that the opposite was also true? Could inflammatory rhetoric and printed materials in such documents as the Declaration of Independence trigger instability in individuals and cause them to act in crazy ways? Yeah, um, so Dr. Benjamin Rush absolutely believed that. Um, this is, he, he ended up worried a lot about what they had wrought um, with the American Revolution and he and other mad doctors believed that the fact that they had lived through this tumultuous period um, and the, the French are saying the same things really caused insanity. He called it anarchy, I believe. Um, he, he created this, what he called another species of insanity that had come out of this time of inflammatory rhetoric. If you look at, for instance, the Federalist Papers, you see a lot of references to not necessarily madness, but other forms of diseases that had kind of come out of the American Revolution, and now they were advocating for the Constitution as a, a cure to these illnesses that were caused by that time of upheaval. Thank you. Uh, Tom is wondering if the Enlightenment that started in Europe regar was regarded as insane by most European mo monarchists as well as the American loyalists. Yeah, there, and I, th I think there's that's a a big question and and a really big answer. So I'll I'll try to boil it down um, to something shorter. Absolutely, some of the ideas that came out of the Enlightenment were seen as being insane. Even people who weren't loyalists but supported the cause of independence were really worried about some of the, the ideologies that were coming both out of the Enlightenment and, and other intellectual strains at that time. Um, for instance, there are a lot of people who support independence. They think that Britain had driven them far enough that they needed to be independent, but were really nervous about forming a republic. They thought a republic was equal to a mad system. And so there's, there's a lot of back and forth, particularly when um, Payne's pamphlet comes out, Common Sense comes out. There's a lot of response to that, some from loyalists who just see all of that as being insane. And of course, Payne himself loved to use the language of insanity. Um, but there's also rebuttals to it from people who supported independence, but thought that Payne's ideas and the other ideas like his just went too far, that they needed something less crazy, <laughs> less. Um, less destabilizing. Uh, they thought that what some of the, the American revolutionaries wanted to create was closer to anarchy than to a stable government and anarchy was another form of madness. Thank you. Uh, Whitney uh, has some comments about the Spurzheim excerpt. Um, she's wondering what to what degree the critique of liberty as madness is a fear of pluralism, as in, wow, there are churches on every corner interpreting the Bible in their own way in Boston. 
um, egads, is insanity. <laughs> but isn't this language a denunciation of diversity of thought and an articulation that conformity is best? If we have too much independence, are we imbalanced? Is it a choice? Um, is choice the demon that drives us mad? Well, choice definitely drives us mad. And I feel that way every time I try to buy deodorant. Um, <laughs> it's just <laughs> like, how am I supposed to choose? <laughs> um, uh, I, I feel that. Um, again, lots of different answers to that. The, the medical doctors were very clear that in many ways, that line between sanity and insanity was a social construct. And they use language very similar to language that those of us who look at social constructions now use that we don't want to punish people or confine people for being different in their thinking. Um, and so, you know, we all, all of us who study mental illness have to read Foucault. Um, and he was a, he was a good philosopher. He was trending yesterday, by the way, on Twitter. Uh, but not such a good historian. I, I think there certainly is some push towards creating people who can fit comfortably into society, but maybe not a desire to crack down on all differences of thought, particularly for the people who really embrace liberty, even though it makes them nervous. They believe that some of the greatest thinkers some of the greatest scientists, some of the, the greatest religious leaders had been deemed insane, even though they weren't really. And so they, they were very cautious in their writings and cautioned their readers to really think about that line. Where do we draw that line between rationality and irrationality? And how do we keep from punishing those who might think differently, but are definitely not insane? Um, yeah, so I think that, but there's also that fear of religious pluralism. And so they, they talk about insanity uh, as being most common in places where there's a lot of choice. Um, this didn't make it its way into my, my book, but I remember being in, in Philadelphia in 2011 and really reading a lot of the anti-Methodist pieces uh, because the Methodists were oftentimes considered insane by their detractors in part because they were at that point really focused on um, damnation and really trying to break people down in order to bring them back to the faith um, in a way that that was really disconcerting for some of their followers. Um, so there's a lot of anti-Methodist stuff out there that I've, I saw a little bit later from what ended up in my book. Um, so I, I think one of the things they're trying to do is really trying to balance between, we, we want liberty, right? We don't wanna clamp down on liberty, but how do we both have liberty and have good government at the same time? And I'm not sure they came up with an answer. I'm just not sure we still have come up with an answer. Right, right. Well, so Paul is also thinking about how religion ended up in your book. Um, and what the role, um, what role does the Great Awakening and other mm -hmm. forms of religious enthusiasm play in the story you tell in the book? Yeah, and it's, it's something that I, I teach a lot about, but it, it ended up not being in this particular book. Um, because I, I think that's one of the places where a lot of people see madness, right? This, this religious movement that changes the face of religion on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean for even the people who wanted that call back to religion, uh, but the more, the more conservative, for lack of a better term, uh, ministers who might have embraced the early parts of the awakening, but then were really made nervous by the enthusiasm. I, I think that would have been a really good topic. It doesn't end up in my book, but there is certainly a lot of fear about the disorder that that causes um, in all of the regions of the United States. But I think particularly in, in the, the South where slavery is also so apparent, um, some of the, the people who were really taken with the first great awakening also started to kind of question the bigger institutions. And that is of course destabilizing in a way that made a lot of people nervous. 
Um, Cheryl is wondering, did you notice major gender distinctions for this period in labeling insanity? Uh, she is thinking of female malady by Showalter, which is mostly British and uh, later period. Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting that the doctors vary. Um, so one of the first doctors, I can't remember who it was now uh, that I read, I remember saying, well, um, men are more, more likely to go insane than women. And I think part of that has to do with liberty, right? If people are more free, women are through coverture less free. Um, and so they're therefore maybe less, um, less possibly uh, able to go insane. Um, but then you have other people who say, no, 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 it, it really is women more than men. Um, I think probably the, the biggest piece of that puzzle that I saw more than anything else is the, the lack of control women who were struggling with mental illness had over their own lives because of the system of coverture, because they are under their husband's command. So Sarah Henry, I think she probably did have a mental illness, but she also doesn't seem to have much control over her own life. Um, and there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of fiction, most of it British, um, about, I think all of it British, about also women who are deemed insane by their husbands because they want to get them out of the house for a while who are put into the private madhouses in places like London. Um, so I, I think that gender dimension is very much there, both in lack of control over whether or not I can make the decision of whether to seek care, um, but also in the ways that that can then be manipulated to put people into institutions against their will for other reasons other than insanity. The, particularly the in in England, the private madhouses were really problematic. They they eventually put together some reforms on that system because it was a way to get rid of your enemies by putting them in a private madhouse, whether that enemy was family or a neighbor or a political rival. Um, but in the the United States and in the colonial North America, you just needed to have a note from a doctor declaring someone insane for that person to be confined. Then that person had no say. Um, and the, the stories that I have are male stories because those were being published, but men claiming to be sane while being confined for insanity. And that's a, that's a real problem in an age of liberty to take someone's liberty away um, and say, you have to be in a straitjacket, you have to be chained, you have to be put in the hospital against your will because a doctor has deemed that you are insane. Okay. Um, um, Tom is thinking about the use of opioids during that time and wondering if you have any comments on how that affected metal, mental health. Yeah, I, I actually don't know. Uh, but yeah, everyone, everyone is using, everyone was using opioids. Um, I'm sure there's a correlation. I'm sure there's, there's information on that correlation somewhere, but I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, Beth has a follow-up question and wondering if you have any specific recommendations for asylum books. Oh, um, well, start with uh, David Rothman, because even though it's old, it's the classic, um, the, the discovery of the asylum. Um, and then I, I can't, I'm blanking on names right now, um, but the, all the stuff about the, the Quakers and the asylum movement, there's good work on William Took, there's good work on, on others. Um, you can send me an email and I can give you recommendations because they're, they're, not, they're not in my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> that all makes sense. Well, so we've um, come to the end of the questions, but through, through this discussion, is there any final thing that you that that it made you think of that you wanted to say before we sign off today um i i can't i can't think of anything off the top of my head that i haven't already covered i think we did a pretty good job uh if people have questions they're always welcome to email me um i'm easy to find i'm out there in the all sorts of different places so just send me questions and i'm happy to do them and 
oftentimes I'm better when I have some time to process the information as well. Well, this has been delightful um, and very thought provoking. I mean, I think that we'll, we'll all be reading history in, in a different way and really thinking through some of these issues and noticing these words as well. Um, and thank you, Jane, for leading such a great discussion. Yeah, thank you everybody and, and thank you so much to all of you at the Clements. It really was, you, you provided such a great experience for me. Um, I've never really had a, a bad library experience, but that was my best library experience. Oh, thank you. That's, that's so kind. Well, everybody enjoy your weekend and thank you so much for joining us this morning and bye.